Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. You are listening to the longest uninterrupted weekly show on goddamn iTunes, Double Feature. I am your host, Eric Ingram, and the other host of the show is uh, one Michael Kester. Yeah, that's me. I'm here every week for five years. <laughs> Could you sound happier about that? Uh, we have two last will and testament films. Oh, yeah. Uh, this episode of Double Feature. Yeah. Uh, they're also spook story tributes. Mm-hmm. And uh, what are the names of those films for people who are illiterate and can't read the uh, file name of the show? We have Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. Excellent. And we're going to spoil those films as best we can. If it fucking bothers you that the films are going to be spoiled, we have the chapters menu, which allows you not only to skip over Elvira, but straight to the end where we tell you what we're doing next week the longest uninterrupted chapter spoiler warning (laughs) weekly on itunes um elvira is uh, set in a small stuffy suburban town in need of rebellion and i'm wondering if this seems like a familiar trope on uh especially paired with the other director for today well so this is what detroit rock city right this is detroit rock city this is adam's uh, family probably mm -hmm. edward scissorhands Some Edward sure. Scissorhands. Let's say every John Waters film we've ever done or has yep. ever existed. Yeah, it's... Uh, oh, yeah, because that's Dirty Shame, so that covers that, too. Yeah, right. Yeah, you got to subvert the... What is it? The Morality Club I picnic? think it's every every <laughs> Joe Dante movie, too. Yeah, the Morality Club picnic needs subversion. Probably anything with a high school or set in the suburbs, I wow. think, uh, yeah. qualifies. But, I mean, where better to put Elvira... Can we just talk about Elvira the entire that show? That is pretty much... <laughs> is that okay? Elvira is the most important part of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Because I have probably 100,000 things to say. I mean, you could see any of those other films for conversations about subverting, you know, the stereotypical kind of non-existent idea about the sheltered Midwest. Right. I think it's more important that I, I just want to talk about the objectifiable sassy elvira i guess yeah there's a lot to elvira the character the person the actor why don't we start with the character right okay so there's a lot that i fucking love about elvira you and i have never had a conversation about elvira ever which also makes this difficult right because i've i've wanted to you know last time on the show i mentioned i was really excited to talk about this yeah and you and i just have never done that and i'm very pumped about it i i fucking love elvira but i think the most interesting and deep thing about Elvira's character is that she is simultaneously a slut and never puts out. That's awesome. I'm really glad, <laughs> really glad you picked up on that. That is one of the most interesting things about Elvira. I was probably going to gonna say it in a more uh, layered, pretentious way, but that's I'm basically sorry. my, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, that's exactly my point. Well, all right. So, She's a sexual object, right? Right. Clearly, that's part of Elvira, the icon. Sexual Mm -hmm. object. That's the outfit and the way she carries herself and the nature of her humor. But she's also ridiculously kind of sarcastic, but just humorous, sassy. Well, she's she's got this thing that I think you and I can really relate to because coming from the suburbs and coming from the kind of background we came from, She's a combination of a goth chick and a valley girl. Sure, definitely. She is every store at the mall, not just half the stores. Which at its heart is, I mean, those two things seem like a sort of, uh, you know, satirical merge. Right. But uh, you find that in reality a lot more oh, yeah. often than oh, yeah. you think. Yeah. Uh, say at the mall, like, right. you were, uh, yeah. like you were pointing out. But what I like is that, you know, her her sort of makeup appears to be a product of culture as if we've created this fetish of elvira sure and the character herself is a reaction to it she's the one who goes okay yeah i am an objectifiable you know sex doll but i'm also not going to take any of your bullshit right you know what i mean right look at this movie she leaves her job over a sleazy boss yep does not think twice about it. it's a principled stand sure right she's just not going to do it 
It's not like she's been putting up with it forever. This new guy just shows up at the station, has one conversation with her, and yeah, while well, part of it's to drive the plot, she does just completely say, fuck that. I'm right. absolutely done with this. Yeah. And she takes off. And that's the beginning of, you know, we were talking on the Humanoids episode with Mars Needs Women about how do you, how do you talk about feminism in a character? Sure. How, do you, how do you know it when you see it? And while that's still something in my mind I'm trying to figure out, Elvira has always been part of that. Somebody who it kind of seems like a studio made her or an audience made her. Mm -hmm. The uh, target demographic you were talking about on that episode is right. what created Elvira. Yeah. But as a person, she's not going to let that, you know, get her down. She's not going to let that oppress her. Right. I mean, she kicks the axe murderer out of her car. Basically, every <laughs> time somebody tries to boil her down to a sexual icon, she has this sense of, I'm aware that that's who I am, and also I'm not going to let you right. treat me that way. Well, she's she's this amazing, and this is where she falls in the film, too, is that she gets to walk into a film looking and acting like every single stereotypical female role in a horror movie. Mm -hmm. She's a combination of Morticia and the fucking final girl. Yeah, right. You know, she's she's walking into trouble. She's there's voodoo death curses all <laughs> over the place. Right, right. And then she proceeds to dismantle and shame every single one of those yeah, standard roles. Absolutely she does. She antagonizes men left and right and then defeats them right. uh, just completely without exception anywhere. And I do want to talk a little bit about the creation of this character, but you see that too. It wasn't so much that, all right, well, if I've got to play this skanky woman, here's how I'm going to do it. Right. It was really from top to bottom creating this character that just defies any kind of uh, convention or really defies the way you would the assumptions you would make when you look at her sure but that's only half her job she's also this uh this hostess right well she she's a horror host and uh she um picked up what the first uh, there's a ton that were real early on but um she got actually sued by vampire remember vampire from edward yeah i remember that uh that and bit at the end Plan nine obviously yeah so right. she she uh she got sued and Vampire lost. She didn't win, and Elvira managed to retain the rights. And oh, that's weird. I always thought Vampira won that. No, totally lost. Yeah, so that's interesting too because at the time, and you know, maybe I owe her some kind of apology because I'm I'm pretty sure when that came up on Ed Wood, I scoffed it off and said, "Yeah, Elvira is basically Vampira." Yeah, I no, I'm right with you. I thought the same thing, and then. Just in spending more time with Elvira, I went, what was I thinking? Right. You know who she reminds me more of? So Ooh. we get this fourth wall breaking thing. We get a, a TV hostess who, so she wants to be on the audience's side. She is the weirdo here. She's the, um, the thing that isn't normal. But she's getting the better of all of the normal people around her. Is this sounding like a conversation we just had about Groucho yeah, Marx? Yeah, it sounds a lot like Groucho Marx. If you steal Vampire's act, you're a total fucking hack. But if you steal Groucho Marx's act, you're just doing what every comedian throughout the history of time has been expected to do. Sure. Well, and, and Groucho Marx is definitely one of those. He's one of those TV personalities that, that landed in the big screen, which is basically what's going on with this film. Is sure. She has no place in a movie theater. Elvira, it's, it's basically, it's the same basic principle as if... Uh, the robots from MST3K uh, just did a movie where they were fucking trying <laughs> right. to. They were trying to be the winning hockey team, right? You know, they, right. there's no reason for those characters to leave. There's no reason for those characters to break the fourth wall where they're going into the movie. This may be sure. one of the few times in history where the fourth wall is broken and somebody who doesn't deserve to be in the film walks in. So I wanted to talk about. Uh, how we eventually get to this character, but I think we have to talk about Cassandra Peterson in order to to look at this any further. Uh, we saw her in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, yeah. and she was Amber in Super Bisto. Yeah. What I love about Cassandra Peterson is that she created the character, she wrote the movie, she's the one, I look at this and I kind of, that was the first time I went, is there something more to Elvira sure. than just... Here's a woman who's playing, you know, a role that looks like it was written by a teenage boy. Right. This is actually something that the woman who plays the role came up with. 
And, you know, we go back to our Artura kind of idea. And I think, all right, you know, this is one person's vision. Maybe there's something to this. So Cassandra Peterson was, uh, she was a go-go dancer at a bar. She did this uh, LA radio thing before she started doing, or I think it was about the same time she started doing the LA TV station, gig, yeah. which was in the 80s. And the station, this kind of explains part of the vampire thing, I think. The station essentially wanted a vampire-like show. Sure. So when I say she created the role, I mean she really created it. Because basically the only premise she was given was the constraint of, we want something that's kind of like vampire. Yeah. So Cassandra took this sort of valley girl uh, character that she's been doing, you know, in stand-up comedy clubs or in this comedy troupe, and kind of morph that into the vampire, you know, goth mm -hmm. sort of aesthetic. And in doing that, also sort of made a commentary on vampire sure. and on horror movie hosting right. and the job she was given to begin with. Right. It would basically be like if somebody came in for American Idol and they're doing a Weird Al kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So yeah, I'm going to I'm going to play this role and audition for this job, but I'm going to make it this thing totally my own. Right. And I think that's just as original as anything we see. You know, look at the movies we do, any of these horror movies especially that big studios create. Yeah. They basically go, "Man, that 28 Days Later was a big thing. We want our own zombie twist, whatever." And they hand it to Zack Snyder, and then he goes on and, you know, makes whatever sure. movie he makes. So a lot of times a studio will start with that one sentence premise and go, just give me one <laughs> of these. this off. Yeah. We're making the new Darren Aronofsky God movie. What's it going to yeah. be about? Just yeah. do, do whatever. You, give me your take on that. And I think that's exactly where this character came from. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing about Elvira versus – because horror hosting is – it's it's – Elvira is not the first. She's not an original concept to be – you know, the person that fucking sits there and talks over the movie and you cut sure. back to and they bring you back to the commercials and whatever. We had uh, in Chicago, we had Sven Gulli. Yeah. Way back. Well, we also had Rob Zombie doing that recently. Sure, he right? did that. Did um, uh, work for TCM Underground was the name of that show. Kind of short lived, but same concept. I'm going to show you a B movie. And I'm going to give you a little bit of intro, outro, commercial break kind of information. Well, also Neil Gaiman did it. He did it for a, a stint too. Did he really? He did a weird horror hosting stint very similar to uh, Rob Zombie's. But his condition, oh, wow. I had no idea. his condition was that he had a creepy, silent, hot goth chick that would help him out <laughs> and that he got to rise out of a uh, coffin. Uh, this is great. Those were his his pretenses but way back when vampire was doing it there was zacherly who you probably don't know by the name but you would know the face mm. and different people there was sven Gulli up in chicago and there was gulardi well we talked about the fright night stuff too right and there, right? yeah exactly sort of the show that whole kind of thing was going on but the reason elvira is so important and so influential is she was the first syndicated national nationally syndicated horror host sure there were horror hosts going on since the fucking 50s right but elvira was the first one that you could watch in new york and la well also being in how smart of an idea right. it was well, and how that's, clever of a thing right and that's the thing is she was the first of all of them to appeal so widely to an audience sure that they no longer had to file it under public broadcasting or we got this cheap ass. It's like, who fucking cares? It's Elvira. Everybody wants to see Elvira. This is, this yeah. character is speaking to a generation like none of these other weirdos have really managed <laughs> sure. to do before. Well, look at her staying power, too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, Movie Macabre was what, five seasons or something? Sure. Well, and she just and came that out. Revival. She uh, just came out with a movie not too long ago. Yeah. Well, this isn't her only one. Yeah. Ton of video releases, all just based off. A lot of that hammer horror kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, totally. B-movie stuff. I think the recent one was completely um, free to use, public domain. That's the word I wanted. I keep thinking in Creative Commons terms. Uh, public domain films. But what I thought was interesting about that selection of films, because that is the topic we are most experts on, yeah. selecting films, 
is how meticulously controlled her branding was. Mm -hmm. I remember a story about um, a studio wanting her to do Cannibal Ferox and her refusing to do it. You know, just not wanting to have any part of anything that pushed a certain boundary. Because that's that's the really the conversation I wanted to arrive at that I love about Elvira. For as much as her image is about sex and the movies are about, you know, sex and violence, I think she's completely harmless. Yeah. No, I think more I, harmless than I think Eli Roth is harmless. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, you know, we'll say everything's harmless, but I mean Right. Really, uh, about as safe as a 1930s cartoon love interest. Sure. I think that one of the other things, too, that gives her an edge is that her films are far less offensive than her. That's the true. The films yeah. Elvira will talk about give her right. the edge because she <laughs> sure. seems sure. like, oh, my God, she's so violent and so overtly sexual. But even that barely pushes the boundary. If you look at the type of people in this movie that are offended by Elvira, yeah, there are people within that town that think those people are fucking crazy. <laughs> sure. Sure, right. I think there's very few parts of her character that are obviously offensive or going for an offensive angle. Sure. I think it's mostly the sexuality, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not even really the humor or the content. Honestly, man, it's cleavage. That's all we're talking about. Yeah, she, we're not even talking about sex or nudity so much as that shape. Well, it's I think it's a combination of the shape and the fact that she's not ashamed that she has that. Yeah. Elvira walks into a room, says, I'm hot. You all want to fuck me back the fuck off. But seriously, look at my tits. Right. <laughs> sure. And I guess some of the humor is it's a lot of double entendre. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's to, to let you know that she is aware her breasts are hanging out. And that's yeah. an iconic part of her character. But I love that, you know, her, I think her being safe is perfect. Yeah. I wouldn't want a more explicit Elvira. Yeah. I actually think that helps break the taboo. You know, you can put Elvira's breasts in places that breasts couldn't normally go. Wow. Because of how, <laughs> I'm going to back this up, because of, I, I think her, I think it's counterintuitive, you know, the kind of safe image she has. It's the sort of thing where, all right, so we're having a conversation with one of the people who's offended in this movie. You know, you're 14 and your mom catches you watching this. And you go, hey, listen, I understand your concern. She looks like a sexy lady on TV. But as it turns out, she's a good role model. It's the kind of as it turns out part of that equation. Sure. Because when you look at the package of Elvira... The most shocking, offensive, not okay for popular consumption part is her cleavage. Yeah. Is her breasts and her double entendre. And you, I mean, it's the first thing you notice. You can't not notice it. Sure. She is a, a black circle around cleavage. Yeah. You know, that's, that is the wardrobe and makeup of this character. And so you always get that shock value immediately. And every single thing that you can learn beyond a picture of Elvira just shows you that this is as bad as it gets. Yeah, I think that the image of Elvira is probably the most offensive. Sure. The more exposure you get to Elvira, right, the less offensive she becomes and the more And when is that true of anybody? Uh, you know I can't what I mean? really I can't really think of anything. It's, you know, that's uh you find that with people running for political office. I mean, it's yeah. just the more you're in popular light, the more people find out about you and sure. they mine your life for details. And I think that idea of not so bad is what lets her get away with that. Right. Because the initial shock buys her bargaining room. Mm -hmm. It becomes, uh, you know. Well, when is she going to live up to those tits? That's, <laughs> yeah, not, the, that's not as bad as the tits, but the tits are coming, right? The, uh, the conversation ends up being about how counterintuitive it is. Mm -hmm. It ends up being about, no, 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 hear me out on this. She's not so bad. And suddenly nudity is no longer the topic of conversation. Right. You start to go, oh, you know, I used to think this about Elvira, but it turns out she's this way. Which is incredible for just what it is, that there isn't something uh, very much like it in the marketplace. But also, that's kind of what that goth caricature is about. It's about the misunderstood person. And so here you have this person who comes off immediately as nothing more than a sexual object. And then you find out that she's a lot, you know, 
a lot safer sure. than you would assume. To talk about goth culture in that light, I think that that transcends straight to goth culture. Goth culture is all about, whoa, don't we look scary? And if if you sit down at a fucking IHOP and you drink coffee with goth kids, they're going to <laughs> what get are you saying, Michael? <laughs> far less shocking very quickly. <laughs> Sure. If you're if you're not upset by the way they look, they have failed and they will not be able to upset you for the remainder sure. of the evening. Well, and that's that's all of counterculture. I yeah. mean, we say goth kids, but before that it was punk kids or after sure. that it was emo kids or whatever right. the fuck kids are now. Yeah, I it's don't know. It's just that type of misunderstood, weird-looking teenager. Yeah, I know I look like this and I don't give a f. The movie is such a good representation of that too because it ends up being a very safe, you know, and being a parody of all these things, it is a very safe parody. It ends in, Patty, you're not a very nice person. You know, right? that's, the big, <laughs> that's the big throw down gauntlet uh, insults, retribution at the end of the movie. So we have all of these conversations that we want to have to a PG or a G audience. And then we do it in a package that manages itself, even in being kind of a commentary to still maintain that uh that feeling that approachable you know this turns out to be a film you could show to just about anybody sure tim burton would love elvira tim burton probably does love elvira so i mean tim burton let's let's just do a six degrees of separation from how much tim burton loves elvira elvira is a ripoff of vampira tim burton made lisa marie vampira in edwood Wow, that's Tim Burton not a lot of promptly there. dumped whoever he was fucking dating at the time to then date Lisa Marie immediately <laughs> following Ed Wood. Yeah, you mean uh, Lisa Marie, the uh, romanticized dream sequence from Sleepy yeah. Hollow? Lisa Marie, Lisa Marie's parts in Tim Burton movies have just been the shaft all <laughs> the goddamn time. Yeah. With maybe the exception of Mars Attacks, but seriously, that's a shaft too. Lisa Marie is uh, one of 100,000 familiar faces yeah. in Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we wanted to think about Sleepy Hollow as kind of a tribute to not even necessarily the hammer horror era of monster films, so much as just staged sure. monster well, movie presence. That's the big thing for me with Sleepy Hollow is that the whole fucking movie, outside of a few establishing shots, is soundstage. That's what I was getting at. That soundstage yeah. monster feel. And I think that that is the strongest homage the film could possibly pay. And what's interesting about that is Tim Burton uses that style so much without a soundstage. Yeah. That by putting it in a soundstage, the style is so drastically dark yeah. that I would say that Sleepy Hollow is probably – the most, if not the only, actually frightening Tim Burton movie. Yeah, I agree with you. This is uh, really the darkest of oh, yeah. it's, uh, anything it's, I've seen Tim Burton do. It's the darkest it gets. It's the most violent it gets. There's really not a lot of laughs in this movie. No. Well, Johnny Depp's character. That's what I mean, is that's about all it this has. This is Johnny Depp's first swing at Jack Sparrow. You know, we give Johnny Depp a hard time. But it's because he's him great. In this movie. I think I think when it comes to great actors like Johnny Depp, we just have to tear them down a peg every time because they're so fucking good. Yeah. That, you know, they got to shut the hell up. <laughs> I love going back to a role like this, and you can really see why someone got famous in the first oh, place. Oh, yeah. He is fucking electric in yeah. this movie. He is amazing. If we talk about Johnny Depp being really quirky or playing similar characters, but uh, while the quirk is just as heavy in this movie as any time we ever mention it, it has this incredible life to it. Especially in the lifeless town of Sleepy Hollow. Sure. Right? Sure. You just, I don't know. I'm just glued to watching him in this movie. Well, in this, this film, more than the others, I mean, you take any of the other individual cast members of this film, maybe aside from Christopher Walken, uh -huh. who is a fucking behemoth for that role. Never in a million years would I put Christopher Walken as the most terrifying human being I've ever seen in my life but really scary, not creepy scary. Yeah, I want to talk about Walken, but I was going to um, let you make your Walken point first. But aside from Christopher Walken, oh, sure. I would say that Johnny Depp outdoes any of the other characters that appear throughout the film, and that is no easy feat. We get Jeffrey Jones, who, 
you is and I wearing have, an awesome wig. Right. An and insane you, wig. And you and I have endless love for Jeffrey yeah, Jones. Absolutely. Um, uh, we get Christina Ricci again, endless love for Christina Ricci. And in what I think is probably her only Burton film, right? Uh, I think. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It seems like you know, she's in all of them, but I think this might be This it. is the only one. I keep wanting to say small soldiers because she does the voice of the fucking Gwendy <laughs> no, dolls, but that's not, not Tim Burton. No, and I want to say Adam's family, but that's not yeah. Tim Burton. And I want to say Winona Ryder is Christina Ricci, but she isn't. Yeah. They just yeah. both had my heart when I was eight, I guess. Yeah. Well, and then you have old greats like Christopher Lee, right. who is, I think, in Vincent Price's Edward Scissorhands role in this movie. Sure. Well, and he's, right? he's, he's the old hammer horror guy. Right, you know, exactly. He's Dracula. He's the, he's the hammer staple. Well, he's also in, um, what's that fucking movie called? Horror Hotel or whatever. The He's the, I don't know if you knew this, Eric, and forgive me for bringing up the RZ on this, uh, this episode of Double Feature. <laughs> I think it's too late. But, uh. Christopher Lee is actually the uh, superstition, fear, and jealousy. No way. Yeah, it's from an old, old horror flick called Horror Hotel. You and I need to uh, just write down what all those samples are from at some point. I don't know why we haven't yeah. done that. <laughs> Christopher Lee is, I mean, modern audiences will know him. Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars prequels. Yeah. I mean, that alone, the two giant trilogies sure. or yeah. even more, I guess, with Lord right. of the Rings. But uh, I remember, you know, the original Wicker Man, which yeah. is even more famous now that there's a not original <laughs> yeah. Wicker Man. Christopher Lee, for me, the the most in-depth exposure. I mean, I again, Lord of the Rings and, and Star Wars were kind of some of the most early exposure for me because I was right. four or something. Sure, um, sure. But the the most those timelines can't work out if I was in love with Christina Ricci when I was eight and Star Wars prequels came out when you were four. My point is that Christopher Lee has a metal record, a metal album. <laughs> Wait, how is that your point? My, that 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 is the first time I ever was Christopher Lee was called to attention for me as somebody wow. I should fucking know is when I yeah. heard when I heard his in the Hall of the Mountain King. Wow. It's one of the most bizarre. <laughs> I mean, it is up it is up there with uh Crispin Glover's the question is whatever. the answer of the question yeah. or whatever right. the fuck it's called. Right. Is it up there with Danny Elfman's Sleepy Hollow score? Man, I don't know what can possibly top Danny Elfman in this movie. I don't know, other Danny Elfman scores. Yeah, probably. Danny Elfman doing the uh the Dilbert score on IFC now. So this is so much more a menacing score Ugh. than anything we'd seen, you know, in in true form of all this other stuff we're talking about being Burton's most menacing movie and the sound stage is menacing and I mean, just compare Christopher Lee to Vincent Price. Clearly, yeah. Oh, yeah. Christopher Lee is the more menacing. You've got if you a darker. You've got a darker great here. Right. You wouldn't hear a Vincent Price sample as readily in a Rob Zombie song. That is although not true. I would love to hear <laughs> some Vincent Price samples in Rob Zombie songs. And then um, executive producer or producer Francis Ford Coppola, yeah. who also has some roots in that past era of, we did Dementia 13 on sure. the show. right. I He's... mean, that would also fit today's will and testament uh, yeah. <laughs> double feature theme. So one of the things that I want to talk about with Sleepy Hollow and that I think sets it so far apart from Burton's other films. And I know that that there are things that definitely set it very close to some of Burton's other films. Is that, and I don't know if you knew this, but it was based on some fucking throwaway slasher script. Oh, sure. Yeah. This was written this was written as one of our favorite movies. Right. Some bullshit, I don't know, uh a guy kills people. Well why do people care about that? Uh yeah, it's I the remember, headless horseman. It was yeah, it was written completely separate from Burton's oh, name. Oh, no, right? it was it was written completely separate from taste, I think. <laughs> uh, sure. It was supposed to be it was supposed to be a terror train level of I right. don't know, some guys killing people. Right, because and somebody's trying to figure it out. <laughs> sure. I start to wonder when that plot. This is a uh, kind of like an out of the past level of conspiracy and confusion. <laughs> yeah. In this film noir type. And then there's witchcraft, which just fucking complicates the whole thing. 
You want to talk about a slasher movie? This reminds me of something Jeremy Caston would write. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Am I a complete idiot here? This movie confuses the fuck out of me every time I watch it. So, yeah, there are two films in in <laughs> in my entire film collection that I watch and go, I know how this, I don't remember how this ends. <laughs> right. I I know right. I know where things end. I know most people die, but I halfway through the fucking movie eric i swear to god (laughs) every time i go christina ricci she's the fuck she's evil as hell she's evil (laughs) as hell in this movie she's a bad guy every time it's that and kiss kiss bang bang that i just forget the fucking sure the fucking convoluted wait no not this but maybe that as well it's a episode of lost i need a blast door hatch map family tree sure to cross names off and circle other names and draw the will edits in the in the margins And by the by the end of the movie, they're saying, oh, but but your hand was cut. And how did you? But I didn't. And I'm thinking <laughs> sure. I'm at that point. They're running circles around me, man. At yeah. that point, right, I right. just I just go, ah, it was that lady. And she also killed the maid for some reason. I see. Sure. sure. <laughs> Maybe that can help you overlook the uh, the fact we're just stealing scenes from Batman and scenes from Beetlejuice. <laughs> uh, hey, there are far worse Tim Burton movies to be stealing scenes from. Scenes from Frank and Weenie and scenes from... <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, I, I'm not going to be one of those people who comes on here and goes, blah, blah, Tim Burton writes the same movie over uh-huh. and over. That's not our job here. No. This is uh this is a show where every movie is the best goddamn movie ever sure. created. Well, I and... do find it interesting. I mean, we have the Batman vest pocket bullet sure. stopper. Right. Which doesn't even it's not like it's not like breaking bad style we wrote, you know, we wrote the characters into a corner and now what do we do? It's not like they wrote, he gets shot. Oh fuck, we shot it. Well now what happens? I don't know. Ah, there was a book in there. I mean, they took the scene and put it sure. in here. Right. Or the fiery windmill, you know, Frankenstein-esque right. ending that sure. is, I'm pretty sure, the end of every Burton film ever yeah. made. Yeah, yeah. Um, the bridge I love, I actually had to go back and look because they get to the Ichabod Crane, you know, oh, Headless the... Horseman, oh, gory, so gruesome yeah. uh, moment. And it's on that same fucking red bridge, enclosed bridge thing from Beetlejuice. Right. It's the same fucking bridge. I mean, these are things that have to be you know, little callbacks. They can't possibly be. It's not like Tim Burton ran out of ideas, the guy who didn't even write the script, and went, well, where where are we going to put this? A bridge. Well, what kind of bridge? I don't know. Production stalled. Just pick any kind of bridge. Well, what are we using Beetlejuice? I mean, that conversation yeah, sure. never happened, right? That's crazy. Right. No. Plus, he clearly didn't run out of ideas till after this film, um, which is why I think this film being so fucking dark and so fucking... I mean, it's so rooted in that old horror stuff, the kind of stuff Elvira would only show, sure, you know, sure. It's so rooted in that, that when you start talking about, well, Tim Burton's got the bridge from this movie. I mean, he is lost in homage at this point. Yeah, he, is, he, right. is, he doesn't realize that he's paying tribute to his own movies. He's paying Which tribute. Which are in turn paying tribute right. to other things. Yeah, he's seven levels deep in yeah. the homage. He is paying so much tribute to so many different things. And he's doing it fucking flawless. If you look at that tree, man. And when that tree starts oh, I know. bleeding while he's hacking away at yeah. it. That is yeah. one of the things that cinema cannot achieve without yeah. somebody like Tim Burton. Just spewing out gore. Oh, and there's a bunch of it's, heads on it bleeds on you. You look at you look at something like the fucking color scheme. It's the same color scheme or the same color type trick that he used for Sweeney Todd where, oh, it's pale and oh, these people are <laughs> sure. dark. Oh, blood is red. And you yeah, right, you think right. something like that and you go, oh, yeah, red because blood and oh, you're using color and black. That's really – but in fucking Sleepy Hollow, man, when something is red, <laughs> you feel like you just fucking discovered a treasure in this black and oh, white yeah. map. I mean – yeah. Gore. Well, when you, when uh, Ichabod walks out with the apron on and just has the blood yeah. over him, or one of the multitude of scenes where he gets sprayed in the face sure. unexpectedly, sure, that's the Johnny Depp quirk in this movie. Is yeah. he gets sprayed in the face with blood? I mean, how could you complain about that? <laughs> the the one that always lasts for me is when the fence post comes through the church window. Oh yeah. Oh, and he gets yanked. Oh my god, this movie has just these insane <laughs> moments, and it's one of those movies. Where 
and, and maybe this isn't you, maybe this is just me, but it's one of those movies where you fucking watch it and that opening credit sequence starts and the mood, your mood drops. And this isn't a fun movie. This isn't a fun sure. timber. You are in for a dark fucking ride. <laughs> Right. And right. then two days go by and you go, that was okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's moments. I mean, we didn't talk at all about Michael Go, who plays the notary, <laughs> the right. kind of, you know, yeah. spooky notary. Yeah. But that death, actor, death too. Death curse number this, one. Yeah. He's one of those guys. Um, he was Alfred in the Alfred, Batman movies. Right. Yeah. I love this guy. And he's one of those guys who's in 200 movies and I've never even heard of any of them. Yeah. Not a single one except. Batman, Batman Returns, the other Batman. The third and, one. Uh, and Sleepy Hollow. But the other thing that keeps me going back to Sleepy Hollow and the, you know, the real reason that I feel like this stands up as some kind of important benchmark, if not a, you know, a jewel, a hidden treasure, like yeah. you said about the blood. That's kind of how I feel about the whole movie. In a pile of boring slasher DVDs, Sleepy Hollow stands out because it's about the Headless Horseman. Yeah. Well, hold right. on. How are we five years into our show and I've never talked about the Headless Horseman? What an awesome icon. How are there not more takes on the Headless Horseman? Fucking Dracula gets how many movies? How many movies have Dracula? How many movies have Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster? Uh -huh. How many movies are there about the fucking mummy? Right? How many movies are there about the mummy with Brennan Fraser? You have a subset <laughs> right. of mummy movies. For some reason, the Headless Horseman, this terrifying, fast, violent, pumpkin-throwing <laughs> creature, only shows up in Sleepy Hollow. That's it. That's the only time you ever get to see him. Crazy. He's not in Imagination Land. He's just right, not right. fucking around. And it yeah. pisses me off because he is really scary. <laughs> well, also, I didn't want to take your bait on uh, Christopher Walken too early. But this is, finally, I like Christopher Walken in something. This is an important moment for me. He's, a, uh, he's just a feral madman. I mean, he's got no speaking part. Maybe that's, you know, part of the reason. But just this uh, insane, carnal terrifying i mean honestly terrifying you know looking past the fact it's christopher walken there's no you can't he dares you to laugh at him sure to go haha i'm christopher walken in a movie isn't that funny yeah and uh he has that look of horror and the the eyes and the teeth and then you know being the headless horseman which just i mean that that definitely pads your numbers on the scary scale and then we're also talking about an interesting death mechanic, which is beheadings. Sure. Which is just this strange kind of very gruesome for how not terribly gory they are. I mean, on a right. show where we've seen people pulled apart, mm -hmm. you know, beheadings are, I guess there's a neck wound. Beheadings, I mean. I don't, what makes them so gruesome? If you take beheadings on paper and uh you come up to me or i'm assuming you at this point too since you're five years into this show and on paper it says and then he cuts her head off you and i would just go oh she gets off easy yeah right oh so she's this isn't one of the violent ones then right but when you see it happen i mean it i think the thing that sleepy hollow takes advantage of by decapitating these people is something that you and i I don't even know if we've ever discussed it on the show, but you take something like Hatchet, right? Mm -hmm. Or Hostel, or these movies where people are just fucking gored and split open, and you watch them mm -hmm. wriggle and hear them scream while parts of their body are slowly and painstakingly removed. <laughs> and you're sitting there thinking, this person is having a very bad time. What's most terrifying about beheadings is the little amount of time between that yeah, person is alive and that person is dead yeah there is no oh they're dying right it's oh that guy's running oh that's a dead guy. there's nothing they can do they can't they don't have a second to regret or to go i should have done this they can't bargain or, there's no yeah there's maybe no bargaining I, it's just i mean the sword swings they're alive the sword finishes they're dead and that's well, it there's no coming back from that and if there was no better way to make that linger it's that after the head is decapitated the entire you know the death is immediate but then there's always the rolling of the head sure and then it stops and you'll look at its face and sure. it's this look of horror yeah just to further go 
oh man, he was really shocked yeah. by the fact he was beheaded. He didn't yeah. see that coming yeah. at all. I mean, and that's the thing is, is you know the horseman with a fucking beheading, you know he's not going to slip on a pukey <laughs> right. ball gag and, oh, maybe they'll get right. away. I mean, the horseman's coming at you, you're alive, and if he stops coming at you, it's because he has your head on his sword. I mean, that's it's really bizarre because you and I are really into some of the more practically violent moments in cinema sure for their artistic and you know their artistic redeeming qualities but sure something about the beheadings in this film are dark and so final that it ranks so high up there for me for some of the most violent and scary murders i've seen in film so we'll recognize it for that, but uh, you know, no film's time on double feature can be complete without pointing out that there is a science versus faith theme to oh, yeah. Sleepy Hollow as sure. well, as if that was called for or necessary. It's just right. another one yeah. of those. Headless Horseman was enough. We were satisfied at that, and then corruption and conspiracy and intrigue, and also you know, modernization versus dogma, the old yeah. way versus the new way. Part of I, why I think I love Ichabod Crane so much in here is seeing him try to use science to solve crimes. You know, he's in this age of unreason. Right. He's in a small town, not unlike Elvira's small town. Sure. And just like that, the entire town is against him and going to prove him wrong. Yeah. And he's coming in basically doing the earliest human recorded version of CSI. Sure. I mean, you do realize that this is just hot fuzz back in the fucking <laughs> early colonial days, right? Well, and it's also one of those moments we see so often uh, through the history of film where the skeptic is wrong and the science fails. And, although I guess, interestingly, in this movie, the science leads him to the supernatural sure. conclusion. Yeah. I we don't, don't get think, to see that happen a lot. I don't think that this is a definitive, oh, Nope, it's faith this time, or oh, nope, it's science <laughs> right. this time. It's, oh, faith would have had everybody in the town decapitated. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Science at least found out it was the supernatural Fortunately killer. Fortunately for science, they found the headless horseman. Right. Traced, science it, traced it back to his meth lab tree hotel room. Right, it was the science that says the uh, the blade burns with the fires of hell. Right. And the deaths were swift yeah. and immediate. If it, if, and it could be no mortal man. If it weren't for science, she would have gotten off scot free. The website is doublefeatureshow.com, which makes the email address doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, which makes this the end of the show and gives us two more movies to do next time. Yeah, next time we're gonna get uh we're gonna get uh some looks at solitude. Uh yeah. we're gonna do Solitude with Company. Yeah, Solitude with Company, yeah. We're gonna do um the trip, not the uh Corman Peter Fonda LSD movie. The uh what is it 2011 Steve Coogan Rob yeah, Brydon movie 2010. 2010. Right, the British one. Can yeah. we say the British Call one? Call it the British one. And then we're going to do the uh I guess it's technically also British Moon. The 2009 Moon with Sam Rockwell and a smiley face robot. So watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>